Cool. All right, let's do the thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I just had a short bit because um, uh, we were thinking, oh, you know, what would be really cool uh, to share uh, with an audience who's interested in like hacks and technical details. Uh, so today, uh, I just want to do a quick walkthrough of actually a customized controller, which is a portion of Flux that does a lot of actuation with different APIs uh, in a Kubernetes cluster. So uh, you, you've heard us talking a lot about Flux uh, and how important it is to the community, uh, what it does, what value it provides. We're going to get a little bit of a black belt under the cover look at what makes customized controller so amazing in the way that it tracks objects. And then we can talk about some uh, extension points for how you can use some of these bits and pieces to do some fantastic things. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit of, um, I've got some stuff already prepped here. Uh, I have a, a Flux environment that I'm going to share my screen and show. Uh, and then we'll take, you know, maybe five minutes or so to just dig around a bit. And uh, maybe we can do a little bit of live coding um, just to, to play with some ideas. Um, I want this to definitely be interactive. Uh, you know, so I've got our Slack open. Uh, I'm in the Weave community uh, GitOps Days channel. If you've got uh, any kind of curiosities, you just want to, you know, like pop in there and, and say something. Um, you know, if you've got a particular question, want me to talk a little bit more about a particular interface or why we did something this way, uh, pop in there. Let's let's have a chat. But uh, yeah, so I, let's get my screen up here really quick. All right. Um, so I've done some of uh, this environment before. I've got a cluster uh, running. Uh, it's just a single node K3D cluster. I like K3D. Uh, from the OpenSUSE Rancher team uh, because it gets you a cluster in like 10 seconds, depending on your machine. Um, so, you know, if I um, yeah, grab my, you can see I've got a, a cluster called Falco here uh, with a single node that's ready, right? So I'm hooked up to that uh, cluster. It's running as a single Docker container on my machine. Um, you know, just some uh, nice Easter eggs. Uh, here, little technical bits if you are uh, new to platform engineering on Kubernetes and you're joining with us learning about GitOps. Um, this is a great way to take the reproducible repos, right, that you use Flux Bootstrap on. Uh, when you're trying to get a cluster to a point where it's a super repeatable DR process, it can be helpful to take your staging or production environment and try to reproduce pieces of it on your laptop and tools like K3D, Kind, and Minikube are great examples of um, uh, like kind of things you can leverage to have a good confidence check that your DR process is going to work. It also can work as an awesome development environment, especially if you're making platform style changes and want to, you know, A-B test uh, or um, do an upgrade or failure test. So uh, go check those cluster creation tools out. Um, I always try to do my demos in a way that can be replicated on a laptop. So the repository that I'm using, and I just did a bootstrap, so it upgraded Flux for me. Uh, but if you go ahead and look uh, at my GitHub, my username is StealthyBox, and the repo is called Falco Flux. Falco is a runtime security technology. Uh, I did a talk about this at KubeSec. It's the same bootstrap repository. Um, today, we're just going to be using this as an example of something that's moderately complex so that we can dig around in uh, different customization objects and Helm objects. So yeah, uh, but go check it out. The structure of this repository is such that we kind of have our bootstrap directory. And then I like to, uh, a lot of people ask us about folder structure. And um, you can see right here, I've got the clusters directory. Uh, yeah, thank you, Stacy. That's a great tip there. Nice. So it's slightly bigger here. Hopefully that's uh, good for the folks at home. But uh, here we've got a clusters directory. And there's a, uh, a specific folder for my cluster's name. So this one's called bakery zero. And you can see I've got a couple of high level directories in here. And some of these directories, like say the kubeless directory, have nested customizations in them that point to some other path in the repo, right? So we go reference a path that's outside of the clusters directory. Since the clusters bakery zero directory is already being synced to the cluster, if I wanna represent other dependencies, 
I want to store those dependencies in other folders. Okay. Uh, so that's one trick that you can use to sort of separate and delegate, go to even different repositories if you want, um, as you kind of separate things, right? So this is just hooked up to the same repo right here, um, but you could add a different one there if you want. Uh, so you see how the library and the functions folder, right? This is just how to get a non-trivial deployment out. It's got dependency management, all kinds of stuff, if you want a good example of how to do those kinds of things. Um, but what we're actually interested in today uh, is that we've got, so we've got a repo that's doing some non-trivial things, right? And if I look uh, in the cluster for the customization objects, which are the things that actually sync workloads to the cluster and can be and can have dependencies created on each other right so you can see i've got one for flux system i have the monitoring stack deployed i have some kubeless functions deployed uh, similarly if we look at like the helm releases right these are the controllers that actually change the cluster right so i've got a uh, installation of falco and falco sidekick um, and i'm curious how does flux keep track of what it is doing. Um, for customized controller, we have to talk directly to the Kubernetes API and somehow from repositories that might be applying potentially hundreds or thousands of objects, um, you know, each, each within their own little section of the dependency graph. Uh, and then with Helm releases, you know, it's clear that uh, if you use the Helm SDK natively, like we do with Helm controller, uh, a true differentiator and testament to the quality of Helm controller is that it uses the Helm SDK directly. Um, but uh, you know, we can we can trust some of Helm's tracking there. But there's still a little bit of work that we have to do to track Helm releases and figure out if state has drifted in that sort of thing. Um, so the controller's code is actually not that hard to read, and I encourage you and go take a dive. But what I'm going to first focus on is the data structures for customized controller, right? So here we have three customizations, right? We have our monitoring stack, we've got the flux system stuff, which installed these other Helm releases. And then we have the kubeless directory where I have my user functions being deployed, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the guts of these customizations. Uh, you just got a little bit of a preview about flux UI, uh, but you should also know that flux purely uses the Kubernetes API with our custom resources and our controller behavior, it is the only thing that is exporting state inside of Flux. So if you use a Kubernetes IDE, like Contena's Lens, or, or the Tanzu team's Octant project, if you want to use Kinvolk's Lighthouse project, if you want to use K9S, a text user interface, uh, you know, maintained by a very eccentric individual who I have the pleasure of knowing personally because he lives here in Denver, um, then like all of those general purpose Kubernetes UIs also let you dig in to exactly what's happening inside of Flux. So if I go under here, I'm using Lens. You can download this. It runs as an app on your computer. You give it a kube config. Uh, I'm hooked up to my cluster and I want to dig into the resources, specifically the customized related ones for Flux. Let's go ahead and take a look at these customizations and switch over to the Flux system namespace, right? Uh, and then maybe we will also add the kubeless namespace. Uh, so here I've got my functions, I've got the kubeless system, right? And then say I was interested in the monitoring stack. Okay, well, let's go ahead and look at the guts of this resource. I might be able to make this a little bit bigger, maybe. How do I zoom in here? Zoom in, control shift. Okay, just gotta, there we are. So if I scroll down to the status section of the customization resource, this is the area of a Kubernetes resource where you get all of the controllers state stored. This is written to the consistent store of etcd, right? And so we've got our status conditions, which are responsible for feeding that really nice uh, table inside Right, like here I can see, oh, okay, these, these things are ready. That's calculated from the case status compliant conditions, right? Uh, and then we even have some revision tracking, right? So here was like the uh, last attempted and applied revisions. Uh, in this case, both of those things are the same, which means that the control loop is healthy and that we're at a good state. 
Uh, you got how many generations we've applied. And then there's this snapshot section, which is super interesting, right? Why is this here? It seems like it's not that much information. What can we do from this, right? Well, what we are doing in the snapshot is we are listing the API groups and namespaces where it's possible that the controller has changed objects, right? And this is done for performance and efficiency. Because if for every single thing that we wanted to apply, we tried to check every single API group inside of the Kubernetes cluster using the discovery API, especially as you registered all of these controllers, you would probably be making somewhere between 50 to 400 queries just to list objects, right? And so here, what we're trying to do is track based off of what we have applied, which APIs we've touched in which namespaces. Uh, 400 is actually conservative. I mean, like you'd probably be into thousands if you had to go to every API group, right? Um, times every namespace. So it's um, it's that's just not feasible, right? But if we keep track when we actually apply the objects, where those things go, right? So the, these cluster roles and role bindings, uh, they don't have a namespace, so they go to the namespace uh, empty category since those are cluster global things that have been modified by the catalog of this particular folder that the customization is synchronizing. And then we have here in the, in the flux system namespace only, but no other namespace. We've touched deployments, we've touched some service accounts, we've touched the service and the config matches. Let's go ahead and take a look at a different one, right? So uh, we were just looking, I believe at, at the, what was it, Kubeless? I don't even remember. Um, but here in the monitoring one, if we scroll down, oh, I was just looking at monitoring. Let's go and look at Flux system. So this customization will have touched many more things and it'll touch different things in different namespaces, right? So here there might be some overlap, uh, right? In the um, Flux system namespace, we've touched a bunch of things related. So here's deployments again and service accounts, but there's jobs. There, that was used for initializing the webhook. There's receivers. Now notice, we're not storing the names of each individual object. We just want to figure out what thing should I list so that I can filter down what the controller wants to touch, right? Isn't that, isn't that kind of cool? Well, now that we kind of have a catalog of everywhere that we should look and for which APIs, we can make a targeted set of list queries to the Kubernetes API. We've reduced our possibilities from potentially thousands of APIs and namespaces that we should query for and gotten it down to a concrete list of just the things that we care about. We know exactly what we've applied, what we would be interested in potentially garbage collecting, uh, where we would maybe want to be interested in uh, health check updates and things like that. So this, is, this catalog gives us the ability to build a full object list. And you can see that for this, particular directory, there's a lot. But for the other one, there was just a few places. So how does that list query work then, right? Kind of begs the question, OK, well, I know where to look, but how can I find out exactly, right? Multiple customizations could be writing deployments to a particular namespace. How can we tell them apart? So now we get into some Kubernetes API machinery fun. Let's go look at the deployments inside of the Flux system namespace. So using Lens here, I'm going to go to Workloads and then Deployments. A little bit of click ops here. I'm just trying to do things read only because if we want to change the cluster, we'd commit to the Git repo, right? But uh, we want to say, look at the Grafana deployment. This is part of the monitoring stack, right? Well, look at that. When Customized Controller actually applies objects to the cluster, it adds a bunch of labels, right? So this is part of the actual declaration that's inside of my Git repository. But these additional things like the checksum, the name, and the namespace, notice that that name and namespace are from the customized toolkit subdomain of our API, right? So these labels are marked by customized controller. These things are not part of your Git repository. And um, 
what the controller is doing here is it's, it's, it's labeling these resources so that you can use a label selector. And the labels are indexed by the API server inside of etcd so that this can be done performant or in a very performant manner, right? So now like we've got this single label uh, with a value that can be indexed inside of etcd. The API server is able to super fast give us a list of exactly the things from the monitoring customization from the flux system namespace and similarly like when you go to another resource that's managed by something else like say here's the kubeless controller manager if i look at the label for that this it can be selected by a different customization name and that checksum is used for garbage collection just just a little hint there as well so there's some uh, because we hash like the results of what customized controller is doing so this is this is really you've just got to hand it to the team uh, that has worked on the designs uh, for customized controller. This sort of garbage collection and querying is super. It, it's a super advanced technique for keeping track of things, uh, and uh, it's built from some very smart primitives that are enabled by the design of the Kubernetes API itself. Right, we keep that catalog of what API groups we should query for this particular customization. And for every object that we ever touch as a result of a customization, we are going to label that object so that it can be efficiently indexed um, as the controller tries to reconcile the next iteration of what that config is gonna look like. It can find everything that the customization has touched before by filtering on the labels in that namespace for whatever name and namespace combination is managing the object because uh, it could be from a different namespace. And then we also store the hash of the build for that object so that we know if it needs to be updated or removed, right? Uh, really cool API machinery stuff here. Uh, I'm not seeing many questions right now. You know, you can feel free uh, to leave some um, questions if in the channel and I can get to them within the next hour or so. Uh, if you're coming after the fact as well on YouTube watching this recording, um, you know, pinging stealthy box in the uh, flux channel of the CNCF Slack is a perfectly good place to kind of talk about these things. And um, there are, you know, as we spread this knowledge, a lot of other community members will be able to uh, speak authoritatively about the catalog and object tracking. Um, some just sneak peeks at what's coming is uh, a little bit of diff support so that we can get better uh, updates when objects are changing and uh, get a little bit of notes on drift correction. Yeah. Um, Jason Morgan asks, uh, when you use Helm releases and customizations, can they reference each other as dependencies? Uh, you cannot cross from the Helm release kind and then depend on a customization or vice versa. But what you do see is in the repo structure, um, Let's see, where do I do this? I think it's in, it's gonna be in kubeless right here. So this is a customization that depends on kubeless or maybe, sorry, is it? One moment, I just need to remember uh, where this is at. It's right here. We, oh, we don't have a depends on for this. But you, you can depend on a customization that is tracking a Helm release, and then you can create a health check on something that that Helm release creates or even the Helm release object itself uh, so that you get staggered uh, rollouts of Helm, Helm releases on something that comes from a customization. So like say you wanna manage the CRD uh, with a customization and then you don't wanna deploy a Helm chart until that CRD is deployed. You can use a customization that wraps that Helm release uh, it gets tracked by the catalog of that customization. You can do health checks and all sorts of things like that, or maybe you don't even need it. And it's a that's a good way to do that. Uh, that's a great question. It's something that gets asked a lot. Uh, the reason why um, the we don't do uh, Helm release dependencies on customizations is because the graphs, uh, the directed graphs that are used to execute the dependency trees are stored in memory inside of the controllers and they are computed on the list of objects and Helm controller and customized controller run as separate workloads. 
Um, so they don't have access to the list of the other thing. And uh, we didn't want to add the complexity of doing those kinds of cross cross kind dependencies. Uh, so that's the technical reason why that doesn't uh, happen that way. Uh, but there's a perfectly acceptable different structure and strategy um, just by using customizations to wrap the Helm releases, since you have to get them into the cluster somehow anyway. Um, and then the uh, link for this repository, uh, I'll share that Git remote one more time. It's right here. Oops, if I could type. It is GitHub stealthybox slash falco hyphen flux, right? Uh, that's my that's my name right there. And then uh, that's the repo, falco hyphen flux. So go ahead and take a look. Awesome question. And uh, it does have some effects as well on uh, why the cataloging is done the way that it is. Um, as far as extension points, uh, you can see how much data is available and uh, what the query strategy is, you know, when you're kind of peeking in uh, to the customizations, right? There's just, there's a lot of data here um, for you to run your own custom queries. And it's very possible to uh, collect all of these catalogs and actually build dependency or um, resource graphs of what customizations touch. And a lot of that logic is built into the upcoming Flux UI, uh, potentially plugins that we might develop for other things, uh, as well as uh, products that people are building on top of Flux. Uh, this is a great extension point. And if you want to know more about how Flux works or build things on top of it, uh, another thing is a GitOps connector uh, does some work with this. And uh, yeah, go take a look, poke around, do something cool. And uh, Kingdon, you're mentioning, uh, would you say that the indexing that it's done is something like what you would see in a relational database? Uh, in a way, it's, um, it's not that powerful, but labels is one of the very few things in the Kubernetes API that is indexed. Um, most things are not. And so using labels for this reason, um, for catalog tracking at a minimum, and then also uh, the garbage collection, uh, it has performance. Uh, considerations on how the controllers do things and what the cost of the queries is whenever you reconcile uh, towards the Kubernetes API server. It's a it's a great question. The indexing is similar in a way, uh, but it's one of the only things that is indexed. Cool. Great. Well, if we've exhausted the questions, uh, thanks for for giving me this opportunity to chat with you all. It just gives me so much life uh, to you know, have the opportunity to demo cool things, show how cool the software that uh, we as a community are building. Uh, Flux really is some of the best in class GitOps tools uh, that you can use to try and build your own workflows, uh, satisfy your organization's needs. Uh, it's awesome to be here uh, with our friends and um, kind of maintainers of other projects in the community. Uh, let's build a, a great formal GitOps practice together uh, and keep getting good at what we do. Yeah. Lee, that was that amazing. Was I love awesome. that. Thanks. Thank you, Lee. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, I haven't given a demo in a while, so it makes me so excited. Yeah, so I exactly. Love doing this, so. yeah. And I'm, I'm also, to what you were just saying, too, you know, I I, I was uh, just thinking about the uh, the talk that Jason and I are about to do. So I was I was struggling to come up with really good questions, but I definitely have a lot of thoughts. Um, and I just wanted to mention one real quick. I would love to see... Um, no, I would. I am really looking forward to seeing and participating in the new um, controllers that are going to be coming out built on the Flux um, toolkit. Yeah, so much Sorry. space for extension, right? Um, that's it's really really solid APIs. Uh, a true formalization of what Flux One was modularized and broken into pieces that people can use individually, uh, extend individually. You know, use exactly what they need. Yeah. So. Yeah. More improvements to come, but we're at a really great place for GitOps right now and for continuous delivery and cluster operations on Kubernetes at the moment. So.